that's where I developed a relationship with Tommy Lee Wallace. And through that relationship, I, I had known him on set as the production designer on The Fog, because he was both production designer and editor. And I had known that he was doing something for Dino De Laurentiis, uh, some, some work on Amityville, I don't remember which one, but Amityville 2. And he was writing and I think directing on that. And he lived around the corner from me. I, I was on uh, Beechwood and, and he was on Scenic, right around the corner. And so we were in walk, within walking distance from each other. And so sometimes we'd get together and socialize and watch a movie or something. Not, not that often, just, just a couple times. But enough that when I finally was coming off of the night the lights went, in Georgia, night the lights went out in Georgia and, and had my stripes as somebody who knew what they were doing at AFCO Embassy, and, and I had set up an eye for an eye, like, what else do you want to do? So I want to do something with Tommy Lee. So really, what do, what do you want to do? I said, I've just read this newspaper article about a 10-year-old boy in Florida who watched way too much television. He killed his mother, and he actually thought that she would be reanimated, just like in Roadrunner. That's how off this 10-year-old kid's head was. I said, I, I really don't know where to go with this. So uh, Charles Egley uh, had, had a deal with uh, Jeff Sheckman, a partnership, and they introduced me to Ted Gershony. And Ted had a take on it, and he called it Test Pattern. And he wrote out a full script for us. And it needed to go to a second draft, and none of them became available. They were all off doing other things. So I reached out to Tommy Lee Wallace and said, uh, read the script, see what you can do with it. And he did. And, uh, and, and he turned it around and, and really made it his. And it was something. So it became the genesis then of Far From Home, which then I brought to Ellen Stelloff at Vestron. And I had in mind uh, a gentleman named Ronald Colby to direct it, who I had become endeared to through our relationships and working on things together. And Ellen had in mind uh, a cool commercial director, prototypically, without anybody particularly in mind. So I said to Ron, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to convince Ellen. I've done everything I can, and, and, and what, what, what can we do and have you do to put her over the top? She's seen your short film that Coppola paid for. Uh, when they were doing the conversation, Cop uh, Ron had a relationship with Zoetrope Studios, and, and he knew Coppola. And he said, uh, finally, what, you know, why don't I just have Coppola call her? I said, you can do that? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're very good friends. He, he'd like to see me direct. And he'll say things like, I'll watch his first cut and I'll make comments. I mean, he'll, he'll say all this to her. Now, what neither of us know is that Ellen's dad, Skip Stelhoff, who ran a, a company that had the rights to Flipper and a whole bunch of TV shows in his catalog, he's a real practical joker. So he'd always be calling Ellen at work and saying, uh, this is Jimmy Carter for Ellen Stelhoff. Uh, this is fill in the blank of a famous person for Ellen Stelhoff. So the day that... Francis Ford Coppola calls, says, this is Francis Ford Coppola, I'm calling for Ellen Stelhoff. And Ellen says back to her secretary, uh, tell my dad I'm too busy. And, and he can hear over the phone. And, and he says, no, no, this is Francis Ford Coppola for Ellen Stelhoff. Tell her to take my call. And the secretary goes, he insists that he's Francis Ford Coppola and says he has to speak to you now. She says, okay, put him on. And Ellen picks up the phone. Dad, I'm busy. <laughs> he says, no, this is Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> well, sadly, Ron didn't get the job, but uh, she did find a fantastic commercial director. Uh, it's actually more videos than commercials. His name is Mir Avis, and he did a bang-up job. 